At long last, the show that you've all been waiting for for many weeks, The Wellington Project is pleased to present to you the first episode of Enlisted for Drink, um, our very own history podcast slash live stream. Before I introduce my guests and the topic for this evening, I'm going to give a quick kind of outline for what this stream slash podcast is um, and what we intend to do with it going forward. So the idea behind this is that we intend to offer you guys a kind of unique experience to the constant politics and current affairs that we have had on this channel so far. And so we thought, well, the best place to start with that would be history, because, you know, most of us enjoy history. There's plenty to talk about. Um, and so what we're going to do is have these streams every fortnight rather than every week. Um, so the next episode will be in two weeks, not next week, just to keep an eye on that. Um, where we just talk about various historic topics. And the idea behind it is to structure it more like a kind of pub discussion, um, so a bit of a lad's chat, more than any sort of formal lecture. That way we feel it'll be more engaging. Um, and also we're going to live stream it, as we are currently doing, for those who are currently watching it live, every fortnight. So if you want to come along and watch it live, feel free to do so. And what we'll do is at the end of each episode, we're going to go through the chat, I'm going to go and, and look at some interesting things that people may have pointed out. Any answers to any questions, any corrections, we'll go through that at the end. Um, we don't currently have Super Chats, and so if you want to say something that you want us to talk about, then just type it in, in the live chat. And for those who are not watching live, we're hoping that with this format, where the stuff to do with the live chat's right at the end, you'll be able to just listen to it. It doesn't matter if you know, you're listening to it in front of your computer at home or... Perhaps you could download it onto your phone and listen to it whilst you're in the car or on the train. So the idea is to have this format of both. Hopefully, we haven't quite got it yet, but hopefully we'll be able to put these onto Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, you know, that sort of stuff. Although, as I say, we don't have that yet. Um, keep an eye on our Twitter if you want to get involved in that. Speaking of Twitter, I've got my Twitter linked here. Uh, so go follow me there if you want to keep up to date with everything that's happening with this show. Also, I have got in the links to this stream for those who are watching it live, um, and it should be there when it's processed for those who are watching it later, links to the Wellington Project's Twitter, the Wellington Project's Discord. Definitely come along if you want to get involved in this show, if you just want to talk about history, talk about current affairs, politics, economics, sport, all of that stuff. We have plenty of channels for it on our Discord, so please, if you haven't already, join us there. We have a link to our website, um, and also we have links to our guests. Speaking of our guests, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, if I can figure out how you alter this layout. So first of all, we have Harry. How are you doing, sir? Hello, I'm very good, thank you. Very excited to uh, talk about the man that we've named this project after for being a conservative icon almost, and uh, a man who you can say confidently uh, brought the British spirit out in the middle of Europe, <laughs> especially through uh, Spain and even uh, at Waterloo, you can say. If you had to describe him in one word, then what word would you use? I know I've put um, you on the spot, but... I, I, I mean, I'm not going to say based. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, steadfast, I suppose. He was, mm -hmm. I, I mean, he was known for, as the Iron Duke for a reason, because he um, would rarely back down in arguments. He, he was very set in his ways. Um, I think he even went to the point of having the same field bed throughout his entire life. He'd rarely actually sleep on a in houses basically on <laughs> proper beds pillows and all that so yeah and it's yeah. every aspect of his life that he was like that as we'll come to discuss yeah. uh, as as an individual as you mentioned as a soldier his military tactics tended to be kind of very structured uh, almost a lot of people accuse him of being defensive but i'd say it's more holding your ground sort of style in a lot of cases and of course as a politician as well um so before we move on to our next guest do you want to shill anything um ju yeah just couple of videos I've made this week. Um, one about Navarra Media going on about free speech because the government doesn't want anti-British people teaching things in the government. And um, also I made a video basically it's called What is a Woman? The Question of the Decade. And I go through how that seems to be the, the quintessential question of the decade because it's such a simple question with such a simple answer that seems to be causing all sorts of debate throughout political spheres um and of course after this stream i will be live on my youtube channel with you jack uh and tailed feature going through guardian articles because that I, I i let them go on for too long without doing one so we need to 
beat beat them up again. <laughs> so actually. we have the name of Harian's YouTube channel here on the screen. Um, so if you're not already subscribed to him, then go and do so. Also, there's a link in the description of this video for those who are currently watching it on YouTube. Um, okay, so now we'll introduce our next guest. So Iron Duke, aptly named. How are you, sir? I'm extremely well, thank you very much. I guess I'll forward the same question to you. If you had to describe Wellington in one word, what would it be? Uh, as a soldier, brilliant. Brilliant, yeah. I yes. suppose that is a good word. Um, what would you say was most brilliant about him? Uh, his uh, his, his uh, understanding of ground, mm -hmm. in, in the sense of how to West place his troops, uh, his timing was brilliant. Um, his understanding of what the British Army could and could, could not do was also brilliant. Um, he was never really loved by his soldiers, but he was always deeply respected by them because he never got them killed for nothing. Yes. Yeah. Um, and in particular, when you talk about the terrain, I think that perhaps when we do start, that would be a good place to start because... There's a big question when it comes to the War of the Seventh Coalition and, and the Battle of Waterloo, where he very famously picked Mont Saint Jean as the position of the battle. Um, how things would have gone down had he not been able to pick that terrain? Because, of course, prior to that was the stalemate at Quatre Brass. So we'll come on to that, I guess. Before we do that, would you like to shill your YouTube channel? Uh, yeah, uh, my channel obviously is the same name as myself. As, as you can see on the screen there, 99 Iron Duke. Um, and uh, in a couple of hours' time, actually, we have our regular Splendid Isolation stream starting at uh, 9 p.m. UK time, uh, which is uh, myself and hopefully some guests looking at um, current affairs from the British and Old Commonwealth point of view, of which there are not too many channels on YouTube that, that do that. Excellent. And uh, we have a link to your channel in the description. So for those who are watching live, uh, go right now and open that in a new tab and make sure you subscribe to Iron Duke. You're close to a thousand subscribers, aren't you? Yep, we're very close to a thousand subscribers now. We should hit, hit it within a month or two, I suspect. Yeah, excellent. So hopefully you can get a few more from this stream. So make sure you go, you will go do that right now. Um, and I'll change the layout quickly and get our names back. And then we can begin. Um, so for those who somehow haven't figured it out. <laughs> the discussion of today's episode will be on the Iron Duke himself, the Duke of Wellington, Arthur Wellesley. Um, so yeah, as I say, perhaps a good place to start would be talking about him as a soldier and his masterful use of, of the terrain. So I'll posit this question and, and those who are on the panel, feel free to give me your answers. Um, how do you think the Waterloo campaign, the Hundred Days campaign, the, the War of the Seventh Coalition, how do you think that that would have gone down had Wellington not been able to choose the terrain? Um, because as I alluded to a minute ago, prior to the Battle of Waterloo, there were two separate battles, the Battle of Ligny and the Battle of Quatre Brass. Um, Quatre Brass, Marshal Ney engaged Wellington and it ended in a stalemate. Wellington was able to retreat to Mont Saint-Jean, which is where the battlefield of Waterloo is, uh, where he was able to position himself uh, on favorable favorable ground um, and await reinforcements from the Prussians, which eventually he did. So, you know, my my question open to anyone on the panel to answer would be, what do you think would have happened had he not been able to choose that terrain? It'd certainly be less of an advantage that he managed to get by sitting on that hill and uh, <laughs> waiting for um, Napoleon to come to him. Uh, whether he'd actually lose the campaign in total, it's I guess it's kind of hard to say because wasn't there another issue with um, Waterloo where French reinforcements couldn't properly back up Napoleon's army because they got stuck fording a river that the Prussians were defending? Uh, the, the, the issue was, so the way Napoleon structured his army is he had several marshals um, mm -hmm. and each marshal was given a corps. You know, this was the introduction of the corps system. And usually the most important part of this system would be the core, the third core, which was the furthest one on the right flank. Because in, in that sort of day, because of the oblique order of Frederick, the right flank was always the one that would push around. And usually it was Marshal Davout, um, who, who was the Iron Marshal, aptly named, uh, who was in command of that flank. But for the Waterloo campaign, he wasn't there. 
Um, he was ordered to stay in Paris and he was ordered to try and recruit more troops to help with the campaign. And instead it was given to the newest marshal at the time, Marshal Grouchy, um, and he went to pursue the Prussians after Ligny and yeah. he lost them and the Prussians were able to get back and support yeah. the, the the British forces. Um, well, I mean, you, you talk about the possibility of, of losing. Do either of you think that the Allied forces could have lost that war? Well, the Allied forces as a whole, no. Uh, Napoleon never had a hope because, you know, even had he managed to beat the Prussians and the British, um, the, the um, Austrians and the Russians and the Pro and more Prussians were going to turn up and were going to steamroll it. Um, you know, he, he was just creating yet more widows and orphans at that stage, as, as he had been doing for several years <clears throat> as Emperor of the French. I think, you know, th th there's two things. First of all, um, Napoleon even didn't realize what a good position Wellington took up, because what Napoleon thought that the woods behind his position would stop the British retreating, whereas the Wellington had actually also already checked and said you could drive gun teams through those woods. So there would have been no problem of retreating through those woods because Wellington, as always, had checked this stuff himself. Hmm. Um, also, of course, he only retreated from Quatrebra because the French lost at Ligny. Had the sorry, the Prussians lost the at Prussians, Ligny. Yeah, yeah. Had the Prussians not lost at Ligny, um, Wellington was perfectly able to hold on to Quatrebra. So, um, uh, but, but I think, uh, in a way, we're kind of doing this a little, a little bit uh, rear about place because uh, obviously this is the end of Wellington's yep. military career and, and maybe we it's should, the climax well yeah maybe we should speak well, I'm, I'm not sure it even really is because like I think the climax was the peninsula war which was just a brilliant campaign yes but, well this comes uh, on to something that I was asking on Twitter so we've had two polls up um and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the chat will give us some answers on these polls that we can talk about at the end we've had two polls up one in the the chat on the live stream which is asking whether he was a better soldier or a better statesman. And another one on Twitter. Um, so people go check my Twitter for that one. Thanks. I've got a banner at the bottom that should show that. Um, that was asking about what his greatest victory was. And I was astounded because, uh, and, and this is alluding to what you were about to mention, Ing, because overwhelmingly, I, I had a list of battles on there, and overwhelmingly the battle that was winning the poll by something like 88% was Waterloo. And I personally, I, I fundamentally disagree with that. I think that it was the Battle of Salamanca. Uh, well, yeah, I, I would probably say Salamanca, but Wellington himself actually set aside in India. Yes, well, Assay was also one of the options. There was Vittoria as well. Yeah. Um, so there were a few options on there, but overwhelmingly, uh, Waterloo was winning. And I think that perhaps the reason for that, and also perhaps this is why it's a good place to start, is because even though it's not the start of his story, it's the one that everyone remembers. And it, it's, it's, the, it's the only one which is well known today, really. Yes, yeah, it, it, in, in large part thanks to an ABBA song, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, I, I should add, because I forgot to mention, I've just been reminded in the chat, uh, Rubber is usually the co-host. He is not here today. Um, the reason he's not here, he was planning on being here, but he's unfortunately, um, he has... Uh, alternative plans with his family and so we won't be able to make it tonight but that's fine because there's the three of us and I'm sure we'll handle things well <laughs> um, so yeah uh, well I'll, I guess I'll, I'll ask the two of you the, the question I put on Twitter which do you think was his, his greatest victory if you had to pick one and why um, Waterloo it's the only one I know any details about <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, okay, well, well, I'll, I'll change the question <laughs> for you, Harry, then, before we go on yes. to Andrew's answer. Um, what is it about Waterloo that, that's special, then, to you, Harry? Um, it, well, it's, it's mostly the, the outcomes, which was that it's what ended Napoleon as any sort of force in Europe. It or not so much collapsed the French Empire, but um, Napoleon was obviously this uh, huge military figure who consolidated a French empire, tried to make it all the way to Moscow, didn't quite make it that time, you know, lost to the Battle of Leipzig. And um <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well I, uh, I would I would say yeah, that Leipzig was yeah. I, I disagree that Waterloo was the decisive battle that ended the the Napoleon was I say it was Leipzig mm. personally. Of course, but uh, even after that he 
was um, exiled, came back, and that's when the Waterloo campaign was huge. And it, it, it it's almost like the SpongeBob meme of how many times <laughs> do we have to tell you this lesson, old man? <laughs> and it was the final lesson because obviously he died as a prisoner of war on St. Helena. St. Helena, yeah. Yeah, uh, he, he, I believe, died of cancer. Although there was some who suspect mm. he was poisoned. Um, but mm. before we go any further on any of that, uh, mm. Iron Duke, <laughs> if you had to pick one battle, just one battle that you'd say was his greatest victory, what would you pick and why? Oh, it's Salamanca because it was a, it was an offensive victory, mm. um, one of the few of, of his career. Well, you you have to remember that he was almost always heavily outnumbered. Mm. And it's quite hard to do offensive victories when you're heavily out. <laughs> it's just a military fact, you know? The limitations so, of the British being the only major continental force to not conscript. Yes, exactly correct. Um, and Wellington was constantly told by his political masters in London that, you know, he had the only British army. And if he lost that army, it wasn't replaceable. Mm. Um, I know. And, and Wellington always knew this, but at Salamanca, where he had rough parity with the French for once, but although only if you include his Portuguese and Spanish allies, hmm. um, he, he actually tore to pieces of the French army. Yes, it was, it was a decisive absolute, victory. Yeah, absolutely brilliant offensive victory. Hmm. On the subject of the limitations of, of the British forces, this is, I know that this is sidetracking slightly, but that's the benefit of this stream is we're allowed to go on tangents. Um, is it one of the things that really hurts me is when I'm whenever I'm having a discussion with someone about the War of 1812 in the United States, um, you, somehow I, I have no idea how somehow you get some Americans who argue they won that war. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the reality was that you know on paper it was a, a stalemate, and you know really if there was a winner then you'd say it was the British. Um, but the, well, the, yeah, the British captured Washington DC and burned the White House. <laughs> yeah, after the Battle of Williamsburg, yeah. And yeah. and all of that was achieved with I think a maximum of seven percent of the entire British armed forces at the time. At and the... some of and some of Wellington's best troops, by the way. One yes. one thing I did want to mention on this stream is that Wellington is often quoted as saying that he had an infamous army at Waterloo. And he did have an infamous army at Waterloo because it, there was a lot of second battalions in it. Um, there was a lot of Dutch and Belgian allies who had been fighting for Napoleon only, only a year or two previously, mm -hmm. um, who were completely unreliable. So he had to mix British troops in with those, or King's German soldiers. Who King's were also German, yeah. the, the King's German Legion who were also very good soldiers. Um, but he had a very poor army at Waterloo. Wellington said of his Peninsula War, that he, with that army, he could, he could go anywhere and do anything. Yes. He, he was not always disparaging of his soldiers at all. Uh, another famous quote that we should probably get rid of because it's so famous is that he, Wellington said, Our soldiers are all the scum of the earth, all enlisted for drink, which I, you know, um, but no one ever quotes the second part of that Wellington quotation in which he says, But it is wonderful the fine fellows we have made them. Yes. You never yeah. hear the second part. Yeah, so he, he said that he'd trust them with his life, those troops. And it's because, you know, many of them were so well disciplined that they became one of the finest fighting forces in, in the world at the time. Well, look, look uh, let, let's be honest. The British infantry in the Napoleonic Wars were absolutely the best infantry in the world, without any doubt whatsoever. They, given equal numbers, they would always be any other army. Hmm. Because it was a professional standing army, as opposed to yes. conscripted, very well trained. Um, yeah. The British, the British two deep line was a much better form tactical formation than the columns that the French often used, and other armies like the Russians and Austrians also tended to use. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it was a much better formation. The British cavalry was not so great; that, that occasionally got out of control. British artillery was pretty good, but it wasn't very big. Um, but the British infantry was absolutely the best in the world, and that is why Wellington had to base all of his tactics in the Peninsula War and indeed at Waterloo, mostly on his infantry. Mm -hmm. well, at, at, Waterloo, at Waterloo, it was you, you've mentioned the King's German Legion. They, of course, were stationed at the various farmhouses, including La Haison and, and Hugomont. No, Hugomont, and... actually, hang on, Hugomont was, was actually um, defended by the guards. 
but like how you say, yeah, that was that was that was the funny part of King's Jail. And it was the Colstrian guards who, of course, were the ones who routed the middle guard when they were committed at the end. So, uh, they, yeah, well, they were amongst the troops that did that, and that, of course, yeah. is why, why today Her Majesty's Brigade of Guards still wear bearskin caps, Precisely. which yes. was copied from the French Imperial Guard who they defeated. Mm. So one of the finest, finest fighting forces. Um, although we shouldn't take away too much from, from Wellington, of course, because by saying, you know, that the, the British army was was one of the best, it might retract from the abilities of him as, as a commander, though, of course, as, as we mentioned, um, a lot of the success was on him. And a perfect example of that was in the Peninsula Campaign, where um, Wellington wasn't originally the one in command of, of those armies. I, I forget the name of the, the general who was in command in 1808 before him, one, uh, well, uh, that was Sir John Moore. Yes, John Moore. That's it. Um, but of course, he he was sent running off to La Coruña. Um, that was when Napoleon was in Spain. He came round, and very similar to the Ulm campaign in eighteen oh five, just by manoeuvring, he sent him on the retreat towards La Coruña. And then after that, uh, by eighteen oh nine, this was when Wellington was eventually given command, and from there it was it was all success. So we shouldn't take away too much from this. Um, one of the things I really like about this story is, as I'm sure the two of you and, and I'm sure many in the the chat have have heard this story, is the story of the the rifleman who managed to shoot a, a French general from miles away. I can't remember the the man's name. Was it Plin Richard Sharp? <laughs> Sharp. I, I, I believe he was the inspiration. I believe he was the inspiration yeah. for Sharp. This man. Was yeah. it Plunkett? His name. Um, uh, the, was, uh, it sounds uh, something like that. There's a very good YouTube channel called Red Coat British Military History, and, and that's got a video about this chap. Yeah. So he, um, the, the, the for, for context for for those listening, the the British uh, this this was in right at the end. It was the winter of 1808, January sort of 1809. It was around that period, and the French were retreating towards La Coruña. Uh, which is in Galicia, which is in the, the northwest of Spain, um, because that's where the, the Royal Navy was. Um, and Napoleon had left by this point. He'd gone off to, because the, the Austrians had just declared war on the French, um, which was the war of the, was it the war of the Fifth Coalition, that one? Uh, yeah, I, yes, that was the war of the Fifth Coalition. So Napoleon went off to deal with that. And the rest of the French were were pursuing the British towards La Coruña in the northwest of Spain. And so there was a, a vanguard action by the British to keep stalling the French. And, and among them were the, these riflemen. Um, and uh, I've been given a reminder from the chat. It was Thomas Plunkett was the, the name of the man. He managed to, from many, many miles away, get this amazing shot with an old musket um, that managed to take out a French general. I, I can't remember uh, the exact distance. Uh, 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 hang, on, hang on, hang on. He wasn't using a musket. Uh, he was a rifle. He was a rifleman. So he was using a Baker muzzle-loading rifle. Right. Um, yes. the, the British Army, unlike the French, did use rifles for some of their skirmishes, the Rifle Brigade, and also the King's Royal Rifle Corps, and also some of the light companies of the King's German Division also had them. Uh, and whereas a smooth war brown vest musket would be, uh, you you might hit what you were aiming at, at um, just over 100 yards, maybe 150 yards if you were lucky and it was a big target. Uh, with a with a Baker rifle, you could hit someone at 300 yards. So not yes. mild. Don't, don't think of it in terms of like modern firearms, but um, the, the, you you could certainly hit someone with a Baker rifle uh, at 300 yards, or maybe a bit more than that if you were a very good shot. Yes. Um, and this was the best of those shots. It was certainly one of the best in recorded history, considering you know the technology on hand. Um, and uh, as as Harry alluded to, this was the inspiration for Sharp. Um, it might yeah. actually he might actually be the inspiration for Sergeant Harper, his right hand man, because he was Irish and he was part of the 95th Rifles, which yes. is what Sharp is in, and yes. obviously Patrick Harper. So. Yeah, the, the 95th, yeah. of course, being the, the most famous of the rifle brigades, probably because of Sharp. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, they also fought at, at Waterloo, didn't they? 
Um, yes. They were, was it, which one of the farm, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, they were outside one of the farmhouses and there was a small orchard. Yeah, they, they were outside La Haye Seine and, yeah, and like the King's German Legion. And as I just said, the people holding La Haye Seine were the King's German Legion light companies. And those guys, like the Rifle Brigade, were armed with Baker rifles. And because they were armed with Baker rifles and not the brown vest muskets that everyone else had, they actually ran out of ammunition, and that's why they had to retreat in the end. Mm. They weren't able, I think the French artillery blew up their own ammunition wagon, and because uh, there was a hell of a massive French artillery battery at Waterloo. Um, and um, I think they blew up their own ammunition wagon, and uh, Wellington wasn't able to get more of the particular ammunition they needed forward. So they ran out of ammunition, and that is why the French eventually captured La Haye Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, from a French perspective, the entire Battle of Waterloo was just a, a slugfest, wasn't it? And they, they had to, at every aspect of the battle, just wear down the British in every position. Um, they had to, obviously, they were against time constraint because they weren't aware whether or not Grouchy had managed to catch up to the Prussians or whether he'd lost them. And they couldn't afford to wait. Um, it rained the previous night, and so they couldn't move their artillery into position until the, the land had dried much later in the day. Um, and then, of course, they had to try and move this essentially immovable object from Mont Saint-Jean, which was the British army un under Wellington. Um, and uh, obviously a, an excellent film that covers this is, is the film Waterloo, which I'm hoping everyone who's listening to this has seen because it's superb. Uh, Harry, uh, have you seen that? I, I, know... I have not seen that oh. or no. Master and Commander I've not seen either. Um, Master and Commander is also excellent, although that's based yeah. on fiction. Um, well, wow. uh, yeah, they're both, they're both excellent films. Uh, Waterloo mm. is one of the few historical films, along with Master and Commander, which I actually enjoy because it's reasonably accurate. Yes. Well, the, well uh, I think one of the, the, the sad things about Master and Commander is that they had to change the Acheron from an American ship to a French one. Yes, because they, of course they, they didn't want to offend American audiences. Well, the, the Americans put up the money for the film. And as you say, the Americans were probably not sophisticated enough to go and watch that movie and say, <laughs> uh, we're the bad guys in this army, you know? <laughs> and of course, no, no, no British company would put up the money to make it because British filmmakers are also lefty. So, you know. <laughs> And of course, the Acheron in that film is based on the ship design of the USS Constitution. Um, yeah, very, very much so. Yeah. Which I'd like to go and see one day. I think that's in Boston, isn't it? Is your yeah, yeah. There? But she she sails around the place as well. Oh, wait, well, still sails? Oh yeah, she still sails. She's the oldest warship in the world that still sails. Uh, sorry, the oldest commissioned warship in the world that still sails, and the oldest commissioned warship in the world, full is stop, the, is, is HMS Victory. I was about to say, yeah, Victory, yeah. which I, I've had the pleasure of going on many times. It's yeah. a, a wonderful yeah. warship. Yeah, uh, she is. Also, um, guys in England, if you're if you're like in the Midlands or a bit up north, go to Hartlepool and go and see HMS Trincomalee, which is a British Napoleonic era frigate, um, which is also well worth a bit. Hmm. And and anyone who's further south or, or just anywhere, it's it's worth going to Portsmouth Historic Dockyard and, and of course seeing Victory. Um and also they have the HMS Warrior there as well and the the ruins of the, the Mary Rose. So definitely worth checking those out. But Harry, you need to watch Waterloo. You, you've got I no mean, excuse at this point. I need, to, I need to watch a lot of films. Um <laughs> Harry, 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 Waterloo is even on YouTube. It is on YouTube. I mean, we're not. Yes. We're not gonna. We're not we're going not to tell the you yeah, but it, encourage piracy. No, but um, you can we're just saying it. the resources are there yeah. should one feel inclined. <laughs> well, it's it's not actually technically illegal to watch on YouTube. It's only illegal to host it. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you got to watch it. I, I, if we're talking about Wellington, whenever I I think of Wellington, I instantly think of the depiction from that film. I think that it. It was done so perfectly. Um, I, and all of my favorite, well, I say all of, most of my favorite quotes from that film, which are real quotes, come from, from Wellington. Um, there's the, the scene where he's sat uh, against the tree with his, his Newcastle just having a rest and 
I think it's it's Ux Uxbridge who comes up to him and he asks him, you know, what what is the plan? What, you know, should should something happen to you? What are we going to do? And he, he simply says to defeat the French, which I think is <laughs> is just perfect. And uh, another one of my favorite quotes, which is a bit less perhaps <laughs> sophisticated, but I find it somewhat amusing, perhaps because it's so bizarre and out of context, was. Uh, when he, he says, if there is anything in this world about which I know positively nothing, it is agriculture. Which uh, <laughs> I'd say is relatable. <laughs> oh, he, 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 had, he had great one-liners that were relatable, for sure. Absolutely. And Waterloo is also good because it shows the um, extremely brave uh, Welsh general Picton, who yes. uh, apparently is despised these days in Wales. Um, well, <laughs> he, uh, he, of course, famously... Um, his uniform didn't arrive at the battlefield yeah. on time, and so he was forced to wear his suit and his top hat to battle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I don't, is know if it's still true. I, I, I don't know if it's still true, but if you went to the National Army Museum in, in Chelsea, in London, um, in the water, some of the in their Waterloo gallery, you could see Picton's hat, which still had the bullet hole. Yes, it killed, yes. It killed, it killed him at Waterloo. I think this is one of the nice um, kind of Easter eggs that they have in the game Napoleon Total War is, uh, of course, in that game you can select which which generals you you want to use, and if you choose Picton, then they they have him there with his little top hat, uh, which I I think is quite a nice little addition that, that they put into that film. Um, sorry, into that game. But on Waterloo quotes, I I'd say Wellington has the the best quotes, but that entire film is is full of brilliant quotes like um when when blucher says you know i i will shoot any man i see with fear in his eyes um and and napoleon saying i, I was in this position at the battle of marengo i i was losing it at, at whatever o'clock and i won it back at seven there are some some great quotes so definitely go go and check that out um, is there anyone who's able to? I don't know if anyone's looking at the the YouTube who's able to see what the poll currently is. Uh, eighty percent as a soldier, twenty percent as a statesman. Is is that because of what Iron Duke and I said at the start, or <laughs> because it was fairly uh, it was fairly even before we went live? I I mean I I voted for soldier before you said it, and um, why I know... did you vote for soldier? I know more about his history as a so I know more about his successful uh, military campaigns than I do about his successful time in office. <laughs> fair enough. Basically, he, um, he, he was a better soldier than I mean. Look, I think he was a fairly based statesman, but he was a better soldier than he was a politician. Mm -hmm. Just because politics doesn't work in the same way as the military does. No, I I personally know less about his political career. Um, it seems from what I hear that he wasn't quite so proactive as a as a politician. I, I don't know if I have that right. Well I recently um I recently read uh Wellington the Years what's it called? The Wellington Pillar of State. Uh written by Elizabeth Longford, who also mm -hmm. wrote the The Years of the Sword book, which is about him and the army. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, he oh, look. He he was a very important uh, early to mid nineteenth century British political type. Um, I think he made some mistakes for sure, uh, and certainly more mistakes than he made when he was a general. Hmm. What sort of mistakes? Uh, in terms of politics, you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, look, I, I I mostly agree with the fact that he allowed. Catholics to serve openly in in the army and the navy, uh, which hadn't been possible before. Although loads of Catholics had, in fact, been serving in the army and the navy as officers, they just had not been allowed to do so openly. But I'm not sure making that legal was entirely the best idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was sometimes too inclined to compromise. Right, but then. Yes. You, you, yeah, I, like I'm, I'm, I would be regarded as a fairly radical Tory back then. So you know. <laughs> yeah, I and I suppose uh, it's difficult to to make judgment because a lot of it depends on one's political positions, and which of course are, are subject to each individual. Um, 
and also it's, I suppose it's it's difficult particularly to look at him because he lived just right before there was an explosion within within British politics. Um, because of course, after he came along, you had the split with the P lights um, following the the repeal of the Corn Laws, and then everything after that was the, the period of, of Gladstone and, and Disraeli. And so, I guess very much he was overshadowed by by all of that. And so, I, I you know we have a unanimous vote here on the panel um, about him as a soldier over him as as a statesman, but it is not unanimous on the poll. And so I'm hoping that when we come to looking at what the audience has spoken, we'll get some answers from those who are in the chat um, as to why, you know, th those who voted for him as a statesman as to, to why they've picked that. So we'll leave that for later. Um, so should we should we talk a bit more about him in his in his early years? You, you were telling me, Iron Duke, beforehand that in particular you, you had an interest in, in him in India as, as his formative years. Well, he started off um, working for the government in Ireland because obviously he was part of the Protestant tendency. Um, people will sometimes say he was an Irishman, but he, you know, he wasn't. I mean, Wellington himself said being born in the stable doesn't make you a horse. Yes. But um, but but um, he was part of the Protestant tendency in Ireland, uh, and he started off working for the British government in Ireland. Um, like he was an aide-de-camp to the, the Governor-General or whatever the dude was called at the time. Um, then, uh, he, he wasn't a very serious soldier at this stage. This was also when he first started courting Kit Kitty Pakenham, um, who was then a very young girl. Um, and at this stage, hard though it may be to believe, like Wellington was a chap who played the violin and uh, was quite musical and artistic. And it was only when he proposed to Kitty Pakenham and was rejected by her brother, who was the head of the family, because uh, Wellington had debts, as most junior officers did have in those days. Uh, and yes. he didn't get, and his, her brother didn't think he had very good prospects. So he rejected him. And it was only then that Wellington burned his violin uh, and gave up music forever, never did it again. <laughs> Um, he, was, he was a very downright kind of bloke, as you were saying earlier, or his camp beds and so on. And uh, it was then that he started to take um, soldiering as a, seriously as a profession. Hmm. Uh, and, of course, back then we still had the purchase of commissions and so on. And he actually got a loan off his brother to make him the lieutenant colonel of the 31st foot. Um, and his first campaign was fought in the Low Countries in Holland, and it was a disastrous British campaign. And Wellington said of it, at least taught me not what not to do, which was very important. <laughs> so <laughs> he performed quite. You critical. see that you see that with a lot of generals, to be honest. In the uh, there are, uh, if you look back at the campaigns of many of history's greatest commanders, then they have very quietly. They tend to have a lot of early blunders, which they you find teaches them a lot. I think there yeah, are a few exceptions. He, really. he, he didn't really, because he performed quite well in this campaign. Mm -hmm. um, his, his own battalion performed quite well. Um, but um, he then, of course, went on to India. Um, yes. And he, had, he lost a couple of very minor skirmishes, which some people these days try and turn into something much bigger than they were. Mm. But they were, they were literally skirmishes with a couple of companies of infantry. Both of them were at night. Both of them were in topes, which is an Indian word for like a wood. Uh, and in both cases, the positions he was advancing against hadn't been reconnoitred properly. So they didn't know where the enemy were. Um, and in both cases, the next morning, Wellington went back in, one of the troops could see what they were doing, and won quite easily. In one case, he, he would lose a man. Um, but uh, th these were like his minor learning bits. And by this stage, he, he, he was reading a lot of uh, military history, including, you know, classics like Julius Caesar and all this kind of stuff. Um, John Cavalier in the chat makes a very good point about Kitty, his wife, that she was a faithful wife, but she was utterly useless in high society. She was. She used to make her own dresses. And, and like Wellington, like very, very attractive high society ladies, basically. Who would make a big splash? That was the mm. sort of like 
was that's the sort of girl he wanted on his arm. And Kitty just could not do that. Yeah. She was she wasn't able to. And by the time he married her, when he came back from India, um, she'd actually gotten she changed a lot, you know, as as young girls do from the time they're sixteen to when they're in their mid twenties. They often change quite a lot. And she had changed quite a lot. And, and Wellington said privately that she'd gotten ugly. <laughs> so, but because he uh, he he had he considered himself engaged to her, he, he married her anyway, which was probably a mistake on his part in many respects. And of course, on the topic of India, we have his most famous victory, which was at Assay, um, most yeah. famous within that campaign with in yeah. India. People often forget that the, when the British were conquering India, they were not fighting against a load of savages with um, spears. Yes, they had guns. Yeah. Or, you know, th these were armies that were often European trained. They were often trained by French and Italian and even American officers and so on. And they often had bigger guns and more guns than the British did in terms of artillery pieces. Um, so th these these were not walkovers by any means. And I say. Wellington was hugely outnumbered and, hmm. and um, absolutely ruined the enemy, again with an attack, an attack where he was very heavily outnumbered as well. And Wellington always said that, Wellington himself always considered that was his greatest battle. Yes. I mean, on the, the subject of the, the way people think about these battles, it, I, it's not just that battle. It seems to be every battle. Oh, every most of the major battles between kind of Western powers and what we think of, of as kind of the indigenous peoples of of other lands with inferior technology, in in reality, most cases they did have the same sort of technology. Like for instance, at Rock's Drift, um, in I mean, obviously brilliant film, but uh, in, in the film Zulu, it's depicted that it was a, a battle at day. And the British were the only ones with guns, whereas the Zulus just had the spears and, and the shields. Although some of them, of course, on the film are on, on the hill with guns. But uh, the reality of that battle is that most of the Zulu in, in that battle did have guns, which they, they got from, um, I don't know how you pronounce it, Iswan something or other. The, the battle that was earlier on um, that day. It is, it is Amluana. If, yeah. if you ever want to do a stream on the Anglo-Zulu War or Rorke's Drift, I'm your man because I used to live 30 minutes motorcycle ride from the actual real world strip battlefield. Oh, excellent. Well, if, if we cover that topic, then we'll definitely invite you on as a guest. But of course, in the Battle of Rock's Drift, it, obviously in the film Zulu, it's depicted that they, they didn't have many guns, they were men using their spears and shields. But in reality, they had as many guns, if not more, than the British. Uh, it, 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 it was estimated at the, the time of the Anglo Zulu War, which broke out in January 1879. Um, there were over 20,000 firearms in Zulu. So, yes. Yeah. yeah, and also the battles took place at night, uh, <laughs> and so they weren't just walking into to barrages of gunfire, of British gunfire in the middle of the day, like like they depict on the film. And so it, okay, I, uh, it's interesting. Rorkstrip, that Rorkstrip, Rorkstrip, the, that was mostly forward night, because it only started at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Right, exactly. And so it's, it's interesting that, that they depict it like this, although, as I say, we don't want to go too far off topic with with the anglo zulu war but in particular you know they, for, I, for some reason everyone seems to think that the indian subcontinent was this this backward technologically inferior place when it was far from it i mean the mughal empire which uh was a a, a muslim empire that that um you know took over india a couple of centuries really before uh, many Western powers got involved were a much wealthier, much more significant power than than the Western powers when they first, you know, came into contact with them. Yeah. Um, it, it took a long time before the West really actually yeah. took uh, Well, even even the um, first and second Anglo Sikh wars in the in the eighteen forties, yes, the Sikh the Sikhs still had more guns and larger guns than the British did. So. You know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, the way that the British managed to subdue the Indian subcontinent wasn't through violent force. It was through using the the very complicated and corrupt internal politics of the Mughal regime and, and turning it against them in order to get people on their side. 
um, which once again maybe is a, a topic for another stream. But I don't, I find it fascinating that that it's depicted in in such a different way. Although perhaps we don't want to discuss that because of the possibility of of uh, talking about politics. Um, so we'll go. We'll try and shift back towards Wellington. Um, so eventually, he's he's given command in Iberia. Do you do either of you think that things would have been different in 1808 when, of course, the, the British had a bit more of a disastrous campaign in, in the Peninsular War? Had Wellington been the one in command? Obviously, he, he was not a, a senior back then. Harry, have you got anything to say about that? No, I don't know enough details about the early Peninsular War, to be honest. Um, so you go ahead. Um, look, Sir John Moore was, was a pretty good trainer of troops. Mm. Uh, that, that's what he's known for. He's particularly known for training light infantry and rifles and so on. Um, and he was good at that. But he was a, he was a Whig politically, um, which is why he was given the command. Mm. Uh, I'm talking now historically. He, historically, yes, yes. He, was, he was a Whig. Uh, whereas, of course, Wellington was a Tory. Um, I think if Wellington had been in command in 1808 rather than Sir John Moore, he wouldn't have gone herring off into the middle of Spain so easily. Because mm -hmm. I think Wellington was a little bit more sensible, shall we say. I mean, you yeah. could call it, you could say cautious, but I don't think it's cautious in that case because, you know, you've got... Uh, yeah, yeah, but this was the only time that Napoleon was in, involved in, in Iberia, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, but also I think Wellington was quite capable of beating Napoleon, but only with a reasonable number of troops. Well, I mean, of course he was quite capable of beating him. He did at Waterloo, but he did. But he you, did beat him. Yeah, yeah I will, we'll come on to that. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure he sure. could have beaten him um, with the forces that he had in 1808, though. No, I, that's that was my point. Is, right, is yeah. Napoleon came into Spain with so many troops, but I think. Had Wellington been in command in, in 1808, he would have worked that out. Mm. And he, although he would probably have advanced into Spain, I don't think he would have advanced so far. Not towards Toledo, which yeah. is where, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it is interesting, that, because um, one of the fascinating things about the, the Napoleonic Wars is you get this crossover between several generations of, of great generals, and you get so... It's, it's almost tantalising. You get so many great commanders... Who come so close to engaging with each other but never actually do. Um, so one, of the, probably the most famous is that uh, in the eighteen hundred um, campaign, uh, which was the one that, that ended with with the Battle of Marengo, um, Alexander Suvorov, who's who's for, for those who know their military history, is is one of the great generals in all of history. Certainly, po possibly the greatest in all of Russian history. Um, he was in command of, of the the coalition forces at the time, and whilst Napoleon was was busy becoming the first consul in Paris and and establishing himself as a as a political leader for the first time, um, Suvorov undid all of all of his progress that he made in 1796 and 1797 in northern Italy, and then Napoleon comes over the Alps. Um, yet there's all those famous paintings of him doing so. And then you get the Battle of Marengo, but unfortunately for history, because it would have been fascinating to see Napoleon against Suvorov. Uh, unfortunately for history, Suvorov falls very ill and goes back to Moscow and dies before he can engage Napoleon. And so that's one of the big what ifs in history. What if Suvorov, who by this point was a veteran, one of the, the great generals in history, had faced a young Bonaparte? And uh, and, and we come close, of course, in in the, the Peninsula War as well. I mean, we did we did get Napoleon against Wellington in the end at, at Waterloo, but we didn't in Spain. Um, because, as I mentioned earlier, Napoleon had to run off back because the Austrians had declared the War of the Fifth Coalition in, in 1809. But he was there initially, and he did send Sir John Moore running off to La Coruña. And so, you know, he perhaps one day could have fought Wellington had the Austrians not declared war and had Napoleon stayed in Spain. But, but we never got that. So. I, I think had Wellington... I mean, look, even Sir John Moore's forces... And Sir John Moore was killed during the battle. Even Sir John Moore's forces, yeah, they, defeated, him, yeah. Yeah, they defeated the French there because had they not done so, they wouldn't have been able to embark on the wrong. Yeah, leadership. although not not under Napoleon. No, 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 not under Napoleon. But they did defeat the French there. 
Um, and they were in a pretty poor state by that stage because they'd been retreating for miles through extremely bad weather in the mountains. Yeah, it was the winter, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the winter in the in the mountainous area of Spain. Yeah, so, and, and so those that, who know don't think about your summer holidays in Spain, it wasn't like that. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 those who know the geography of Spain, I mean, everyone thinks of it as hot, but there's a big variation, and. Um, uh, Galicia, which is where La Coruña is in, in the northwest of Spain in particular, you get some awful storms there, really bad weather. And the reason is that it's right next to the Bay of Biscay. It, you get all of the Atlantic weather coming in. And so it's and, and rather and than snow, being sunny. And, yeah, you get snow and all the rest of it. And yes, uh, yeah. So John Moore's troops were often even lacking boots and stuff by the time they got to La Coruña. So yes. um, uh, they did quite well to, to beat the French there, and then they were able to be embarked by the Royal Navy. One of the things that is important to look at when you look at the Peninsula War, which of course was started off as Britain defending Portugal, which is Britain's oldest ally, um, and then turned into liberating Spain, and eventually, in 1814, uh, Wellington actually invaded the south of France, um, at the same time as Napoleon yes. was up north fighting Leipzig and all this kind of stuff. Yes, um, yeah. Actually, a bit later than that. But yeah. Yes, it, this was the 1814 uh, campaign. So Leipzig was at the tail end of 1813. Yeah. Um, and then this was when Napoleon was fighting. He was fighting in the Champagne region against That's right. the armies of Silesia and Bohemia. Often often described as one of his more brilliant campaigns because he it was won't. heavily outnumbered by that. Stuff. Wellington himself. Uh, Wellington himself famously said, if there was one campaign that convinced me of Napoleon's genius, it was this. Um, 1814 campaign. They call it the Six Days campaign because in six days Napoleon managed to heavily outnumbered, four to one. He managed to send Blücher and the army of Silesia running back. Um, but of course, but, he, but of course, he could do nothing about Wellington's British army. Yes, uh, the yeah. British and Portuguese army because Wellington wouldn't take the Spanish into France because he knew what the Spanish would do in France. So you refused to take any Spanish soldiers there because <laughs> he was quite a humane man in his way. Um, and uh, so he took his British and Portuguese troops into the south of France. And, and the, the I think it was Salt, 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 Salt who was, who was fighting Napoleon, uh, sorry, weren't in that stage, um, wasn't yeah. able to stop. Wasn't yeah. able to stop. Mersenna had died by that point, hadn't he? So. But yeah, the the uh, and I mean Wellington beat just about well Wellington did beat every single French marshal sent against him in in Peninsula. He beat um, every Sol, single one. Sol Massena, Massena was one of the better ones, although admittedly he was he was on the verge of death by that point. And um, was it Berthier? There there was a there was a third. Um, the, the, but there, there were three of the key marshals. There, there was Sol, there was Massena, and there was another one. It might have been yeah. Berthier. Yeah, Mas Massena was the first dude he beat. Yes. Um, uh, he also... Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to have to go and check this. Do you think that... Because this is one of the, the, the other big questions. Do you think had Napoleon sent what many consider to be one of the better marshals, such as Davu or Lan? Whether he he'd, he'd, he'd oh, well, he'd Wellington would have beaten them too. I'm absolutely, you think so? Yeah, absolutely certain. Um, what Wellington was the best tactical commander of his day, including Napoleon. He was the best tactical commander of his day. Do you want Without, to elaborate? Um, as a battlefield commander, on one day of battle or two days of battle, Wellington was the best general of his day, without a doubt. Hmm. I, I think he, I, th I think he was superior to anyone else, including Napoleon himself. Uh, even Napoleon, on his really good days, would probably not have bested Wellington. I think it's very diff difficult to compare because there's a an enormous contrast in their styles. Um, I mean, I, I kind of somewhat alluded to the way that Napoleon fought earlier, but to break it down for for those who were uh, are listening. Essentially, the, the way Napoleon saw battlefield tactics, he, he was heavily, heavily influenced by Frederick the Great um, and, and also by Suvorov, who I, who I mentioned a few minutes ago. These, these are his two big inspirations. And these sort of inspirations were figures that they won wars 
through quick, decisive maneuvers. Um, and you can see this clearly if you look at each of Napoleon's campaigns. And the way that he would do this was he reformed the core system, which I explained earlier, where he broke his army into smaller variations of armies. And then rather than having major supply chains, they would be encouraged to live off the land and forage so they can move at great pace. And then his basic idea was to just outmaneuver the enemy before they could even get into a position to fight. Um, and so just as an example, the Ulm campaign in 1805, where he defeated the entire Austrian army without even a gunshot, without a battle, lasted something like 15 days. Um, there we, we mentioned the Six Days campaign uh, in 1814, where he defeated Blücher, who, was, who outnumbered him four to one. Uh, within six days. Um, in 1796 in Italy, he defeated the Sardinian Piedmonts before the Austrians could reinforce them within a couple, about two weeks. Um, and so this is the way that he fought, by essentially moving very quickly before the opposition could get into a position to, to essentially defend themselves and then outmaneuver them. And so the question with, with Wellington, if the two of them were to face, which there's so many variables, would be whether Napoleon could maneuver his forces quick enough that Wellington wouldn't be able to get into get himself into a position where he could then entrench himself and defend himself. I think that's well, the, the decisive question, isn't it? Well, Wellington seldom entrenched himself. I mean, leaving aside the lines of Poros for Dras, of course, yes. um, which, which was a In different Portugal. matter. Yeah, which was an entirely different matter, and, and which was a total surprise to the French. Of course, they, they didn't even know they existed until they wound up facing them, <coughs> and then quickly realised that they weren't going to be able to break through them. But um, what Wellington generally didn't entrench himself. What he, what he did was he was a master of using a reverse slope position, so that if you were a general on horseback facing the British position, you basically couldn't see most of the British army. So yes, you like, have, at, you're, like at Waterloo. Yeah, exactly like at Waterloo, but also mm. at many parts of the peninsula. And um, the the French would therefore have to attack semi-blind. Mm. Uh, and, and generally speaking, um, also Wellington had realized that, you know, the, the French would tend to attack in these very heavy columns with vast clouds of skirmishes in front of them because that's the way they learned to do things in the revolutionary wars because it was easier to train troops to do that than it was to fight in mines much easier in fact um and in, in theory the french were supposed to advance in columns and then form into a three deep mine whereas the british used the two deep mine they, they were supposed to do this but they almost never managed it and when they tried to do it the british under British fire, they would generally like get so pummeled and then bayonet charged that it wouldn't work. Um, and one of the mis no, mistakes that people think happened in the Peninsula War, it did occasionally happen the two units would like fire volleys at each other at 100 yards for half an hour or something. That did occasionally happen, but it was the exception. On most occasions, the French would come up to the British position. Uh, uh, the British would stand up because Wellington would have his men lie down because it meant they took less casualties from artillery and so on. Uh, they would stand up. They were disciplined enough to be able to do this, which most armies would not, of course. Um, they, they would form up in their two deep line and they would fire one, two, or at most three volleys. And then they would bayonet charge the French and drive them down the hill, almost invariably. This was how nearly every battle in the Peninsula War went, if you actually look at the battles and the first-hand accounts of the guys who were there. I think um, what we have to note when comparing these is the different situations they found themselves in. In that Napoleon was, he was an emperor, and so he... Well, so he self-made emperor, let's be fair. <laughs> self-made, but I mean, um, you know, from his perspective, that didn't matter. Um and and so with his position, he was commanding much larger forces in much larger battlefields. And the idea was that because he, he also, as, as well as having the battlefield concern, had the political concern. And so for him, the basis was 
essentially to end this war with a thunderclap, which uh, the, the famous words he said at the Battle of Austerlitz, was his mindset with every campaign he went with. Whereas Wellington was, of course, approaching his campaigns from a very, very different position. And he was assigned a smaller force, as you, you yourself have, have mentioned, in foreign territory. Um, in the Peninsula case, it, it was an attempt to liberate the country from French rule. Um, and, uh, and, and at all times, his supplies came from the sea. And so he had to be very careful to not overextend himself so that he could get this constant supply. And so ultimately, you know, it, it's, it is very difficult to compare them because of this. I mean, you would never find, for instance, Wellington in the same position that Napoleon was in in 1805, where he, you know, had to rapidly march onto Vienna in order to knock two empires out of a war within a span of days. It's just a situation that Wellington never found himself in. And by the same token, Napoleon never found himself in a situation that Wellington found himself in, where he had this tiny army um, attempting to liberate a whole country um, with, you know, with supplies from the sea. Um, and so, you know, I, I find it very difficult to... That's, that, that's entirely fair. Mm. I, I would just say two things. I mean, look, one reason the British were able to operate in the peninsula in particular is because it was a peninsula and the Royal Navy dominated all the waters. Right, yes. Yes. Um, you must never forget the vast importance of the Royal Navy in the Bogoli Wars. And um, beyond. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, yeah. Uh, down to today, if only the government took any notice of it, but they don't. But anyway, um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <clears throat> but having said that, had uh, Napoleon faced a Wellington when he was advancing on Vienna, probably wouldn't have got there, in my opinion. Well, uh, with what sort of numbers are we talking? Because well, obviously a, a key factor in here is the amount of troops under yeah, command. I'm, I'm and... talking about had Wellington been, had Wellington been an Austrian commander mm -hmm. with, with the same skill set that Wellington himself had, which he probably... Instead of General probably... Mack. Yeah, yeah, and, and Mack was I'd, I'd agree. I'd agree with the Ulm campaign. Because the problem with the Austrians in the Ulm campaign is that they... Oh, it was the Russians' fault, wasn't it? Because the Russians' calendar was different to the, the Austrian calendar. And so they yes. were 12 days behind. And so they were like, oh, you know, where are you? You're supposed to be here. Whereas the Russians were... They were still 25 miles away. Well, well um, Napoleon often benefited from that sort of thing. I mean, like, when uh, Prussia foolishly declared war on... Napoleon, in 1806, yeah. Yeah, when the Russians weren't ready to help them. I mean, it was just... Stupid, stupid. Yeah, well, N Napoleon famously said, didn't he, the, the the idea that Prussia could could take on me alone is foolish. Um, and, 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 and he and visited the Frederick the Great, the and he said, gentlemen, if this man was here today, we would not be in Berlin. Yeah, and also in that campaign, the main battle wasn't won by Napoleon. It was, won it was by Davout. Yeah, exactly. It was Davout, yeah, yeah. at, at uh, the twin battles of, of Jena Auerstadt, wasn't it? Well, they're, they're called twin battles because Napoleon called them twin battles. <laughs> yeah, Davout, it, it's, 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 it's astonishing what Davout did there. He ran yeah, smack yeah. bang with just the third course, smack bang into the, the main, the entirety pretty much of the Prussian army. Not only yeah. did he hold his ground, but he pushed them back and won the battle, which is uh, astonishing, which is why I, I asked earlier whether even Davout, whether you, you think that even Davout would I, I think I think Wellington would have beaten Davout, like I say. I, I, I the am, Iron Duke uh, against the Iron Marshal. Uh, uh, I, 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 am, I am firmly convinced that Wellington was the best um, tactical general of, of the day. Firmly convinced of this. Anyway, we've got 25 minutes left, so I think that what we'll do now is we'll go through what people have been saying in the live chat, and then we can wrap up and we'll give you guys a chance to show once again. Um, so does anyone have access to the poll to, to see how it's doing? Harry, have you been keeping an eye on that? Yeah, the poll at the moment is 83% for as a soldier, 17% as, as a statesman, um, so... which also reflects how much we've been talking about each. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, um, there's a unanimous agreement on the panel mm. about him as a soldier, and so we're yeah. naturally going to talk about it more. Absolutely. So let's let's see if we can find. Uh, we we have to say that George the Great and Powerful in the chat has pointed out that the Iron Duke was actually a marshal himself. He was field marshal, 
the Duke of Wellington. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that what uh, what Jos was saying there was um, the Iron Duke oh, oh, is greater than the Iron Marshal, is in Wellington better than Davu. But yes, um, the, uh, yes, technically his rank was Marshal, wasn't it? Um, well, he sent, he sent um, I believe he sent the Prince Regent a uh, French Marshal's baton that he'd captured at Victoria, if I remember mm -hmm. rightly. And so the um, the um, uh, the, the uh, English, uh, not the king, but the um, Prince Regent, sent him back the Marshal's Baton of England in return, so, <laughs> which is pretty cool, really. Uh, well, I mean, on the topic of of kind of military um, items uh, of the day, I think it's really sad that the French in 1814 at, at Fontainebleau uh burnt all of the banners of the, the regimental banners that they captured over the years i mean all of that history went up in flames um this was as napoleon was abdicating to go to elba hundreds of prussian and austrian and russian standards just that they, they burnt them all to, to prevent the allies from getting hold of them and very 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 few british ones yes yeah well of course these were from um the ones that napoleon faced and and he didn't face the british he, he did it too long didn't he and uh yes, he and did, he yeah. did in as we mentioned in in 1808 in the peninsula but i believe that at this point in in time that these were the only times that he'd faced the british I, could i just could, could, could i just give you one um story about wellington which i yeah of course I think people don't often realize is that wellington in later life um, after he became a civilian, um, he always carried a guinea or two in his waistcoat pocket. Uh, and the reason he did that was if he met a genuine uh, veteran of his from the peninsula of Waterloo, who was on hard times, I mean, he would ask them a couple of questions to make sure they were genuine, not, not a con artist. But if they were genuine, he would give them a guinea which in those days was like about like the equivalent of about three weeks pay for a private soldier. Um, and he uh, always in his later life, he did that invariably. So he was not quite as hard and uncaring a man as he is sometimes portrayed as being. He had respect for his veterans. Yes. Um, so we've got some comments from the chat about him as a statesman because, we, as I say, we, we wanted to hear people's views on him as a statesman because um, for a while prior to us talking about it, um, him as a statesman was actually winning the poll. Hmm. Um, so uh, first, John Cavalier mentions a, a book that people might be interested in. So he says, um, Rory Moyer writes a fantastic biography. So I, I don't know if anyone on the panel has read that. I, I haven't had the pleasure myself. No, I haven't read that one. I, so, I would suggest I would suggest a TV documentary series if you can find it called The Iron Duke by um, yeah I'm trying to remember the name. It's a, he's a great British military historian. His name's escaping me at the moment. Um, I've actually met I actually met him as well. Um, really good chap. Um, John, uh, sorry, Richard Holmes. Richard Holmes. Right, the Iron Duke okay. by Richard Holmes. You can find some of it, at least, on YouTube. Okay, so worth checking out. And and John also says he wasn't the best uh, speaker, so left a lot of that to Peel. We, we of course, mentioned Peel earlier on. Um, and then he mentions that one of the reasons why he thinks he was a great statesman. He says, <clears throat> given the revolutions occurring elsewhere, the fact that we did not also have one and end up sans monarchy, is possibly attributable to Wellington. So he argues this is one of the reasons why he was a, an excellent statesman. Um, anything to say on the panel? Uh, the, only, the, the main thing I'll say about his uh, time in office was I'm, I'm very much pro-Roman Catholic emancipation at the time. Mm. <laughs> For obvious which, reasons. Which, which was a, a prominent issue at the time. Um, yeah. Of course, you, you had the various Emancipation Acts later on. Mm. Gladstone it, himself was a big campaigner. It, it, was, it, was, it was probably a sensible move. Um, my, my mother was a Roman Catholic from Ireland, so I, I kind of get that. 
Um, I, I just don't think he had, he was as sure-footed as a politician as he was as a general. But then he was such an extraordinary general; it would have been almost impossible to be as sure-footed as a politician. What one thing I would like to say about him is that you sometimes see that um, he he kept the British Army like uh, from evolving when he was modern chief, as he was for years up until his death in 1852. Um, that's actually not true. What, what Wellington did was he, he, he had a very difficult time in that period between um, 1816 and 1852 when he died. Wellington had a very difficult time, including when he was commander in chief, which he was for a lot of that time, um, in keeping any sort of realistic British army going at all because they just wanted to get rid of it. I mean, if you look at the mm. British Army today, we're in exactly the same position today. The British Army today is so ridiculously small, we'd find it very difficult to beat up Liberia. But, um, but and Wellington faced exactly that situation. The, the politicians weren't willing to spend any money at all on the British Army. And Wellington managed to preserve enough of the core infantry uh, cavalry, artillery, and uh, Royal Engineers units. There still was a British army when the Crimean War broke out. Yes. Uh, if, if Wellington hadn't been there, probably that army would have been far more useless than it actually was. It's actually uh, the the Crimean War changed quite a lot um, with regards to the attitudes towards this. Because, of course, prior to that, Gladstone had been trying to once again get rid of income tax um, although he was defeated in his budget because of the Crimean War um, and the need for a war tax to, to keep the country going because of course the, the income tax was introduced by William yeah. Pitt the Younger in the Napoleonic Wars um, John Cavalier in the chat makes the very good point that Wellington was very interested in new technologies and so on in relation to the army but he was fighting against leftists who were demanding the army be dissolved to fund rubbish. And yeah, that's basically the truth. Yeah. <clears throat> um, where were we? So Jos says he was the first PM to let Brunel dig a tunnel under the Thames. So it's a, a, a nice little bit of trivia, I guess. Um, he also says... Pretty sure he helped write the book on tropical diseases in the Philippines. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Because when he first arrived in India, he was sent off in an expedition to that part of the world. Uh, John Cavalier mentions, and, and this relates to what, what I was mentioning about the differences between the circumstances of Napoleon and Wellington and why this makes it difficult to compare them. He says, his command in the peninsula was divisive. A number of politicians back home were not in favour at all. Yeah, the, the Whigs hated him. The, the, the Whigs and the more Whiggish Tories hated him. Mm -hmm. As you say himself, uh, as you say, he was himself a Tory. Um, I see Fez has, has come into the chat, although he's a little bit late. Um, uh, several of them saying Richard Holmes. So this is backing up what you were saying, Iron Duke. Yeah, it was Richard Holmes, yes. Yes. Um, John Cavalier says his time in the Royal Armory was a uh, he was across his briefs. He was an incredibly competent administrator. Um, one of the things we've also got to look at, and it comes into what you, you were saying uh, earlier it, 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 about um, Napoleon's troops living off the land, which yes. basically means stealing things from civilians. By the way, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's how they were able to go such enormous yeah. distances so quickly. Wellington never did that. No, uh, he used the supply good. lines to the Royal Navy. Yeah. And, and kept his, and kept, and built up a good raw wagon train and all the rest of it, who carried all these supplies up to the troops, all of which, of course, was destroyed after the Napoleonic Wars by the government. Um, and Wellington wasn't able to save that, and that was one of the problems in the Crimean War, by the way. But yes. um, Wellington was aware that, like, if you took a British army into Spain, and you then robbed all the civilians, the Spanish would not regard you as any better than the French. 
because that's yes. what we do. obviously the uh, the <laughs> the Spanish public opinion was a huge factor in the the Peninsular War because many many guerrillas rose up against the French because of the way they perceived the French to have treated them, uh, yeah. which was with an iron fist. And it was also it was also a very good uh, excuse for banditry amongst the Spanish as well. But yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> as often is the case. Um, John Cavalier says uh, he witnessed one of the first civilian rail deaths. So, yes, he did. Yes, he uh, did. This goes back to what we were saying about how he, he lived, you know, just before this explosion in, in, in Britain. Um, you know, he, he really was a man between two ages. Jo John Cavalier comes up with a nice little thing here. Uh, he was ruthless with his own troops when it came to stealing. But the reason he was ruthless with his own troops when he came to stealing is he knew what it would do to the army if they got the same reputation as the French. That was why he was ruthless. Yes. Uh, one thing we need to also point out about Wellington is that twice uh, Wellington was seen in, in literal tears at the losses of his own troops. One, once at the siege of Badajoz, which where, where the British paid an enormous price to break into the French garrison, Spanish town. And then went crazy for a couple of days because they had paid such an enormous price to get into this town. Wellington was seen in tears looking at the ditch, which was covered in dead, dead redcoats. And after the Battle of Waterloo, he was also seen in tears hmm. at the losses of his own army. Something that is totally impossible to imagine of Napoleon. Who just regarded so, soldiers as ants? The, he, he famously said that the, the next worst thing to a battle lost is a battle won. Yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. Although uh, with with Napoleon, I mean, it's difficult for us to know how he perceived his men. Although, say what you will about him, he was exceptionally good at minimizing casualties within his own army. Um, what Napoleon? Yeah, the, Napoleon has one of the greatest no, no, lopsided no. casualty rates in history, and that's an no, 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 no. If if you look at the, no, I'm sorry, I just can't agree with that. If, look if, at the numbers. No, if you look at Napoleon after about 1809, um, he he got this idea that the best way to win any battle was an enormous frontal attack. Well, that was the issue with Boris, wasn't it? Well, not only at Borodino, he did it in several. It's the other famous ones. example. Yeah. Um, but he uh, it, and he did it. At, he even did it at Waterloo. He, 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 no flanking attack, just straight down through the middle. Because I'll do a big artillery battery. That was the then, second oh, quarter along. Yeah. And, and, and then I'll do a massive frontal attack. And Napoleon's casualty rates were enormous after but, the Battle of uh, um, After Wagram in 1809, which was the last. Um, you have Wagram and Aspern Aisling. After those two in 1809, um, you have the issue, the fundamental issue is, is I mean, I, I mentioned is is the Russian campaign with Borodino, which I attribute more to him having control over a much, much larger force than he was used to. Um, and the reason I argue that is because then in the 1814 campaign, where he suddenly has a much smaller force, he goes back to his old self. Um, well, he doesn't have any choice because he doesn't have this great big massive army anymore. No, but it, but it, then it, it it poses a question as to whether or not, you know, this was a matter of him caring or not, or whether it was a matter of the inability to control much larger forces. Um, Look, this, this is in my humble opinion, but in my humble opinion, Napoleon did not give a shit about anybody else, basically. Well, we, we, we can never understand truly what someone truly cares about or what they say you know that's that's something that only they can know but if we look at the, if we look at the figures then napoleon stands out among all of the generals in history for having outstanding casualty rates i mean really they are lopsided i would i would really love to compare i've never been able to do it but i would love to compare wellington's with uh, napoleon's and i guarantee you wellington's with i i, 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 I would, I, I don't. I don't want this to stream. I don't want this stream to go on. But I have compared Wellingtons and Napoleons, and Napoleons are better. Um, just but, but, but but that maybe that's the stream for another time because we are running. Yeah, all right. Time. All right. I, I just don't believe that. I'm sorry. I don't. I, I mean, you, you you're welcome to to look them up. But as I said, no, I, I, will, I, will. I will. I will. I will. Um. So he says. John Cavalier says Wellington was ruthless with his, with his own troops when he came stealing, and then he says. 
He was also opposed to the cessation of flogging in the army. Uh, links to that. So that's quite right. The previous but, point. But quite right because um, quite right because um, most men were never flogged. Some men were flogged a lot, but most men were never flogged. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the way it always worked. And then Craig55 says um, he has linked a YouTube playlist of the TV series that UI and Duke recommended in the Discord. So best oh. to join the Discord if you want to see it. So for the, anyone who's listening who is not currently in the Discord, there is a link to the Discord in the video description here. Um, join it and you can see this playlist that has been linked. Um, of the documentary if, if, that's been if recommended. Craig's linked that on my Discord, my Discord's a closed Discord, but um, I'm, I'm uh, some... which which Discord did you put it in, Craig? Craig's Craig's on mine, so he might have linked it in mine. He's also on ours. <laughs> oh, okay, so fair enough. If you link if you link it in um, John's one, then you'll be fine, Craig. But like my my Discord is a closed Discord for a reason because it's basically just for streaming. So yeah, all right. Well, well, if, if Craig hasn't put it in ours, then if he could do so, and then there we go. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that this gives us a really good opportunity to to once again show the Discord. Uh, if if anyone enjoyed this stream, wants to get involved in future streams, just enjoys talking about history in general, then join the Discord. There's a link in the description. We have a dedicated history channel and we have a, a dedicated channel for this stream for Enlisted for Drink. So you can use both of those and, and talk about history. It's very active. And in addition, we have channels for pretty much everything, you know, a very active Discord community. We have, you know, general chat, but then also we have chats on with, with channels dedicated to, to politics and current affairs and economics and, and so on. We have channels dedicated to, to history, as I mentioned, Channels dedicated to philosophy and religion, to art and aesthetics, to sports and fitness, with a, a currently a very active discussion on football going on. Um, so, you know, there's something for everyone in there. So if you're not already in it, then I, I thoroughly encourage people to join. There's a link in the description. Additionally, we have a link to our website in the description where you can find all of our articles and all of our videos and podcasts. So feel free to go to that website and, and to bookmark it if you haven't already done so. Subscribe to this YouTube channel. Subscribe to Iron Duke and Harry's YouTube channel. I'll give both of them a chance to show once again in just a minute. Um, and also follow everyone on Twitter. Um, I've had on, on the bottom of the screen, I've had my Twitter and the Wellington Project Twitter both uh, crossing the, the screen. Um, Iron Duke, I, I don't believe you have Twitter, do you? Uh, no, I'm not on Twitter or Telegram because they want you to have, give them a phone number and I won't join Things okay. to the point you give them a phone number. I am on Minds, um, and I'm also on Gab. Okay. Um, do you have, uh, assuming people, you, you, you're willing for people to get in contact with you there, do you have links to that on your YouTube? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Be on my, and um, we are also on Odyssey as well, uh, right. YouTube, yeah. but, um, which you can also find on my YouTube channel. So I guess this this gives a chance. We'll we'll allow both of you to shill your your things again. Uh, so Iron Duke, do you want to to shill your your channel once again? Yeah. First, apparently, I need to apologise because I apparently threw out swearies. I, I didn't <laughs> That's know. That's all right. I, I I didn't catch that one. So oh, I if I did, that. if I if I did, my apologies. I didn't. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. My channel was uh, ninety nine Iron Duke and. In about half an hour, we'll be going live with our 85th Splendid Isolation stream, um, which you guys might find interesting. So come and look. Excellent. So if, if everyone could subscribe to Iron Duke's channel, anyone who's listening right now, um, make sure we help him get into what to 1,000 subscribers. I, I would also just say that like, people like John Cavalier and other people from John's channel have also been guests on my streams quite frequently so. yeah so it's a, a nice close-knit community um and harry do you want to show your stuff yes uh, you can find me on harry and good eve i believe it's in the description of this uh, stream uh i'm try and make a video or two videos a week uh you can also find me on tail features channel every week and of course i do my own newscast on the Wellington Project every Tuesday, the other side of the hill, which usually has a panel of 
guests from other people involved in the Wellington project. So catch me there next week. And of course, in about half an hour from now, you can catch me on my channel where we will be laughing at the Guardian with Jack and Tail feature. Yeah, so ju just as with Iron Duke, uh, if everyone could go right now and subscribe to Harrion, then mm -hmm. that would do everyone a world of good. And of course, subscribe to this Wellington Project yes. channel because we, we, of course, want all of you here. Um, this is just the first of many episodes in this series, and we have several other series going on at the same time. Um, we had yesterday um, Publish and Be Damned, which is John Cavalier, who's, who's in the chat, his uh, weekly live stream uh, where he talks about a variety of issues. At the moment, he, he's carrying, uh, covering the Stoics. Um, we've just finished talking about Epictetus. Um, I believe soon we'll be going to Seneca and then Marcus Aurelius. Um, I, I have myself been on these streams. So if anyone is interested in Stoicism, then definitely go check out that. You can see links to those on this channel. So subscribe to the channel and check those out. We also have the links to them on our website, which is linked below. Um, and also, Harry, you you have your own uh, series on, on this channel. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, the other side of the hill just showed that. Um, but weekly newscast, I'll be picking up headlines that have caught my eye throughout the week. Uh, it's usually quite political, but there's also... Uh, cultural things such as last week we had an article about more than half the babies in the UK being born out of wedlock and how that's uh, showing a decline in uh, family values in the UK and things like that and people on the panel usually come in with their own experiences their own opinions and it can be quite a lively discussion so catch on Tuesdays excellent and uh, as I mentioned at the start and listed for drink this podcast shall be back in two weeks so rather than being a weekly thing, it's a fortnightly thing. Um, and uh, we, I, I can announce now what the topic for episode two will be. Um, for the second episode, we want to tie it in with the current topic on Publish and Be Damned, which is the Stoics. And so what we're going to do is talk about the history of Stoicism during the age of the Antonines and, and Rome. And it's what many consider to be its golden age. This is the age that... Um, Edward Gibbon famously said that it, it, the best time to be alive as a human would be to be a Roman citizen during this period. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about why Stoicism and Epicureanism and then eventually Christianity became these, these massive movements and, and specifically how this relates to, to the Roman Empire and its rise and fall. So if that sounds interesting, then keep an eye out on the Twitter and on the Discord and here on the YouTube channel for it. It will be in two weeks' time. All of the details will be on Twitter and on the Discord. Um, so I, I hope to see you all then. Um, thank you to everyone in, in the live chat who has been here for the first episode. We've had a really good showing. You've all been very active. I hope to see you all in two weeks. Goodbye for now. <laughs>